All right, good morning, everyone. So today we're gonna continue our discussion of the support vector classifier. <clears throat> and here we have um, the final form that we developed last time. And uh, <clears throat> so we see that we have this hinge loss, which um, we can look at it here. So we have this hinge loss, this looks like this. And then we have another term that looks like ridge regression. And what the hinge loss does is any time that this uh, sign corrected score is greater than one, which means it would be classified correctly. In fact, anything greater than zero would be classified correctly. But if it's one or greater, we say no penalty at all. But if it's less than one, we put a penalty that increases linearly how far it is below one. So that's what this hinge loss is doing. And overall, <clears throat> um, the effect of this is to define a region, which sometimes we refer to as the street, Here's a better one, the region. And all the samples that um, <clears throat> have this signed distance, this would be like y i gamma i, uh, less than a value. <clears throat> In other words, the ones that on this page give scores over here. Those are the support vectors. Those are the samples that are used to define where the boundary is, all the other samples that are classified very easily are ignored in forming that um, boundary. And then the parent parameter C uh, determines both the width of the street as well as the number of support vectors that are gonna make up that boundary. So we saw last time that when C is very large, the street is very narrow, <clears throat> and as a result, the number of the support vectors is fewer. On the other hand, when C is very small, the street is very wide, and the number of support vectors is larger. And when you have um, fewer support vectors determining that boundary, there's more variation from one experiment to another, which would mean that you have a higher variance. On the other hand, when the we have a lot of support vectors. The boundary doesn't change very much from one experiment to another. So you have low variance, but you have high bias. You can see in this picture how the boundary is now actually making some errors on those uh, training samples because it's using all these other ones, which are actually easy to classify. And it's actually, as a result, making mistakes on the ones that are harder to classify. So basically, we have a trade off between um, low bias, high variance, and high bias, low variance that we can choose with C. And C is a parameter that we, we should adjust using um, cross-validation, similar to how we adjusted the, the alpha parameter in lasso or the C parameter in logistic regression, where we had a ridge, uh, ridge term. So that's sort of a summary of what we saw last time. And so today we're just going to go a little bit deeper into this and eventually we're going to come up with a big improvement to this method. Okay, so um, so let's take a closer look at this is our <clears throat> cost function here for the SVC. Let's take a closer look at the solution, the optimal B and W. So as we know, um, in unconstrained optimization, what we do is we often set the derivative to zero. And um, the reason why is that here you can see, so if I, if I look at the optimal parameters and I look at the gradient with respect to B, I know that should be zero. Similarly, at those same parameters, if I take the gradient with respect to W, that should be the zero vector. Okay, so question is, can we do this for this cost function? So let's 
take a look. So what's complicated is this term here because of this maximization. So, <clears throat> so let's focus on derivative with respect to B. So B appears here. So the first question is, when does this B affect the cost? So because of this maximization, B affects the cost only when this term here is larger than zero. And that term is larger than zero when this term over here, this Y term is less than one. Because when that's less than one, um, <clears throat> then one minus that term is greater than zero. Okay, so in the case that that yi term is less than one, this whole max term simplifies just down to this right here. And in that case, we can take the derivative with respect to b, and you can see it's relatively simple. You're just going to have <clears throat> a minus yi over here, and then a c and a sum over there. And so we can write that whole thing, that whole derivative like this, where the alpha i in this case is just the value one. Okay, so that's that's what happens in this case. Now, <clears throat> another case is where when this yi term is greater than one, then one minus it is gonna be less than zero. And so when I take the max, this term completely disappears. In that case, you can see there is no b in the cost function. And when we compute the gradient with respect to b, we just get zero. So I can use the same expression from before. I'm just gonna set alpha i to zero. Um, and then, yeah, and then as you can see, uh, get the same expression. It's again of this form, just put with a zero. Okay, and finally, there's one more scenario, which is actually the trickiest one. And this is when this term here is exactly equal to zero. So when that's exactly equal to zero, the trouble is that when you take the gradient or the derivative with respect to B, um, if, you, if you look at what happens as B decreases or B increases, there's actually, the gradient is not equal. So there's, there's a discontinuity in the gradient um, and the gradient basically doesn't exist at that point. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna put a question mark down for alpha I. So we're gonna say, okay, this analysis maybe uh, isn't revealing everything that's going on. Uh, but again, the reason we're doing this is just to get some intuition um, for now and, and for later. So we'll just be content to leave this with a question mark. And <clears throat> so we have this expression here, the derivative with respect to B. We have these alpha I's. We know in most cases what's gonna happen, but in this sort of weird case here, we're not sure what's gonna happen. Okay, so ne the next thing is we can repeat this analysis, the gradient with respect to W. As you can see, it's gonna be very similar. We're gonna to have to consider those three uh, cases again. And the only difference is when you take the gradient with respect to W in this term, you're gonna get XI instead of one, like one when we took the derivative with respect to B. And we have the gradient over here. The gradient of this is gonna be just the W vector. So applying that to the previous expression, we get this. So it looks very much like this, but now we have Xi here and a W there. Okay, so these are our two expressions for the gradient uh, with respect to the parameters. And finally, <clears throat> what we can do is we can rearrange this last expression to say W star equals this term. And now when you look at this, you can see that, okay, for sure, I'm not gonna use, so I'm gonna put in a zeros for all the i for which this term is greater than one. And when that term is greater than one, those are the samples that are on the correct side of the street and you know, outside the street. Those are the ones that, that are being classified correctly and easily, and we're gonna ignore them. And so what that says is here, you can clearly see that the final weights are gonna be a function 
only of the XIs that are either, this tells us that they're in the street or in the wrong side of the street. And then this tells us, this is the case when they're exactly on the boundary. So we can see that W star, the optimal W vector, depends only on these support vectors. These are the vectors such that this quantity is less than or equal to one. So that's part of what we get out of this analysis. We're still not exactly sure you know, what happens. Um, what are the alphas if we're right on the line? But that's OK. And we're also going to see that this analysis is going to be useful later. All right. <clears throat> are there any questions on this before we move on? All right. So <clears throat> another thing uh, that's useful to know is sometimes if you read about the support vector classifier um, in different textbooks, or I think even the Wikipedia page, I believe it writes it this way, you may look at it and it may look unfamiliar uh, relative to what we've presented in this course. And that's because it's often used uh, written in terms of these things called slack variables. <clears throat> so these are going to be defined. The, the way I think it makes sense to connect it with what we've done is to define them like this. So remember, uh, let me see if I can zoom out. So essentially, we're just saying, call this whole thing here xi. -I. And then, you know, I'm just going to have C. Uh, yeah, C times the sum of this xi -I plus this term. Okay, so that's what we have here. Okay, <clears throat> now the other thing besides that change, rather than uh, it is, is to write it as a constrained optimization. So if you look at the form of xi, -I, you can see xi -I is the maximum of zero in this one minus y i z i. So that means if it's you know the maximum of those two things, it needs to be certainly greater than zero. So we can write that constraint and it needs to be greater than this. And so here's our z i. So, so in addition to writing this, they'll add a constraint such that xi i is greater than zero and xi i is greater than this for all i. Okay, so it's just a different way of writing the same thing that we've, we've derived using some different variables. And these variables actually have a meaning. Um, <clears throat> being defined this way, they basically tell us how much we have violated the margin. So, um, <clears throat> so for example, when xi i is zero, that means there's no violation at all. The sample is outside the street and on the correct side of the hyperplane. So for example, if we're talking about class two, these two points here, would have xi i equals zero. <clears throat> now, when xi i is between zero and two, that means that you're inside the street. So for example, this term would have xi i, uh, I don't know, I'm just guessing maybe you know, point, point 0.8 or something. And if xi i is greater than one, that means you are more than halfway across the street, which means you've crossed the decision boundary, which means you'll actually be making a decision error on that sample. So, uh, so if we're talking about the red points, you know, these guys would have xi i less than zero, or sorry, sorry, these are xi i exactly equal to zero. Um, this one is xi i somewhere between one and two. And you know, if you if this if this red point was all the way over here, that would be xi i greater than two. So I think the slack variables are um, after everything we've talked about, hopefully they're pretty easy to, to understand. And it's just another way of writing the SVC. So if you see it, you won't be surprised. All right. Any questions on this? All right. So um, the last thing to talk about is 
we've talked about you know how to formulate the support vector classifier. Uh, we focused on basically how to derive the parameter or how to how to train it. The next thing I talk about is how do we apply it to a new piece of test data. So if we have a test vector x, so I'm, notice I'm not writing a subscript i. Subscript i would mean the i training sample here. I just have a new vector that's not part of the training x. And so I would create the score z. Again, no subscript i. So this is the score corresponding to x, and I'm using my optimal parameters. And I know that those optimal parameters uh, have this form. So there's the C, which is that, that regularization parameter we have to choose. Obviously, this is our training data. And then these alpha i's we saw before, these guys are going to be 0 for the non-support vectors. And they are going to be um, somewhere between, well, they're, they're 1 for samples that are in the street or on the wrong side of the street. And when you're exactly on the boundary, we're not exactly sure what values they take. Okay, but the key point is right now that there's zero for the samples that are not support vector. So let's plug this expression into here. And then we can get, we can see immediately what the score will be for the test features X given all the training features. And remembering that alpha i equals zero for all the xi that are not support vectors. So when we look at the xi's and ask which ones are involved in making in, in this in, in applying the uh, SVC, we can see that all the non-support vectors have no bearing on the final score. So essentially what we're doing is we're doing a linear combination of the inner products between xi, or sorry, between our test vector x and every support vector xi, that's what this is. Then we're you know, changing the sign and we're doing some weighting here. <clears throat> so again, the key point is that the support vector classifier uses only the support vectors in making its decisions or predictions, whereas logistic regression is gonna use all the training samples. So the, the <clears throat> conclusion of all this is that the SVC tries to focus on what is more, most important when making decisions, it tries to use the samples that are being that are hard to classify or are being incorrectly classified. The, the test, the te oh, sorry, the uh, training samples that are hard to classify or being incorrectly classified. Okay, so um, and we'll we'll see this uh, expression again today. All right, so that that finishes the um, discussion of the binary SVC. Are there any last questions on anything? Okay, so the next thing I talk about is what do we have more than two classes? So in this case, <clears throat> similar to what we did with logistic regression, we can think about multiple scores, one for each class. This is where we have k classes. So this is the score for class one and training sample i and so on all the way down to class k training sample i. And we create those scores using intercept terms that are separate for every class and then a weight vector that's separate for every class. And if we like, we can put all these together into a matrix capital W, we can put these together into a vector B, and we can write the score this way as well. So this is going to be a k-dimensional real vector. <clears throat> so the question now is, how do we compute the parameters in B and W? So similar to what we saw in logistic regression, one option is to separately train k different one versus rest binary support vector classifiers. So we just keep splitting up our data into one class and all the others. We train a support vector classifier. Then we look at another class and all the others. We train another binary support vector classifier and so on. And in doing so, 
you know, we train these guys one at a time separately. So that's one option. But we, we saw in multinomial logistic regression that we had another option where we could jointly train everything together. And we can do that here too. Another option is to jointly train these using uh, an approach proposed in a paper by Kramer and Singer. And this is the, uh, the new loss function. It's a little, looks a little bit complicated. Um, here, this part is not surprising. This looks just like a direct extension. Remember the Frobenius norm is the, or squared Frobenius norm. That's just the sum of the squared elements in the W matrix. And this looks like the hinge loss, except we have two sums and a difference between two scores. So that part is new. However, if you want to try to connect this with uh, our binary case, what you could do just to kind of convince yourself that, yeah, this, this is consistent, is you could focus on the case of k equals two and then try to simplify this down. Actually, just let's say try to simplify this part. This is the part that's changed. And, um, and it is possible to do this. Um, I don't think it's worth getting in all, all the nitty gritties, but basically if you focus on y being either one or minus one, because we're in the binary case now, and you just kind of do some transformations, you can reduce this back down to the regular binary hinge loss that we saw before. And this is gonna be for a, for a um, an intercept that is going to be the difference between the two of these that remain and a weight vector that is the difference between the two weight vectors. Um, so basically, the main point is this does match what we did before, but it is a way of extending it to multiple classes. So, um, so we have those, those two options. So the next thing I talk about is how exactly do we implement all this in scikit-learn? And it's pretty straightforward. So there's a function called linear SVC, which does exactly what we've been talking about. <clears throat> and here you can see for multi-class, you have the option of Cromer Singer, which we just discussed, or you could use OVR, one versus rest. Those are your two options there. <clears throat> Another option is the, uh, the loss. So the hinge loss is exactly what we've been talking about. And for, yeah, so the you know, hinge loss would do, would do this. Now, it turns out that because this is not differentiable, it makes, uh, it, it, it gives us a slightly harder optimization problem. We can't use the gradient methods we would like to use and so on. So there is another option. It's actually the default option in linear SVC is to use the squared hinge loss. And so when you do that, the optimization problem is friendlier, but you're no longer solving the same SVC that we derived. And in my experience, when you go with the squared hinge loss, the performance is worse, but the algorithm runs faster. So that's another thing you, you need to decide. And if, if squared hinge loss is the default, then and you want the hinge loss, then you have to specifically tell it to use the non-squared hinge loss. And of course, you have to specify uh, the value of C you'd like to use Although there is a default, I think it's probably like one, but <clears throat> those are the main things we need. So like all the other sklearn commands, you instantiate the classifier, then you call its fit method on the training data, then you call its predict method on the test features and outcome the test, uh, or, yeah, the test label predictions, and then you can compute the accuracy by comparing the predictions to the true test labels and so on. So when we do this on our MNIST experiment, we get 90.7% accuracy, which 
outperforms logistic regression by half a percent. So, okay, that's that's good, right? But you might say, well, it's kind of disappointing because we spent a lot of time going through all this intense math and it all came down to 0.5%. So you might be kind of disappointed. Um, so what I'm gonna say is it's not the end of the story. Um, so that the, the finale is, we're gonna see that next and we're gonna get a huge improvement over this, but at least so far, we do have some improvement over logistic regression that we obtained by focusing on the training samples that were hard to detect or hard to classify and ignoring the ones that were easy to classify. Um, <clears throat> there is another way of implementing this. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later. It's using a different command that again, we'll talk about later. Um, but this one is actually going to be faster, especially when the data set is large. So this is, if you really want to do the, um, you know, what, what we've talked about so far, like you either want to solve this problem or you want to solve this Cromer Singer problem, then your fastest approach is going to be to use linear SVC and SKLearn. Okay. Any last questions on SVC? Okay, I see a question. Does K refer to the number of classes to pick from? Yeah, so the capital K all throughout this whole semester, I try to be consistent in capital K being either the number of classes we're choosing or the number of uh, different labels in a, in a multi-label uh, regression problem. So capital K is a number of classes. And then sometimes when I, when I want to index within those capital K classes, I use the little k as the dummy variable to index. So, um, all right. Any other, any other questions? All right. So now we're finally going to get to the finale, the support vector machine. And here's the big picture. What we've done so far is we've derived this support vector classifier. And we saw that it works very well when the features are nearly linearly separable. But there's going to be some problems where it doesn't work very well at all. And the reason why is because it's a linear classifier. It's the whole framework is built on linear classification. And in linear classification, what you do is you pass a linear boundary through your data set. And if your data set, like this one pictured here, if there's no way to pass a linear boundary through it to get a good classification, then you're really going to be limited by the linearity of your method. So, um, so one idea to get around this is to do some sort of nonlinear feature transformation of your data first that makes you know, after the transformation that makes it much more linearly separable. Maybe it's perfectly linear separable, or maybe it's just much closer to linearly separable. And that is essentially half of, the, of what we're going to do. We're going to come up with a nice transformation. And then this is sort of um, an illustration of what we typically do. When we do this transformation, we we transform into a higher dimensional space. So here I'm starting in two dimensions and I'm ending up in three dimensions. And the idea is that when we go to this higher space or the hope is that somehow we can pass a plane through the data in that higher space and make it more linearly separable. And so that's, that's illustrated here with this toy example, but um, that's the hope. <clears throat> but as you can imagine, there's a cost to this if you increase your dimensionality, you're going to have more weight coefficients to have to design. And we know that that has a penalty. It means higher variance and so on. So to try to get around that and also higher complexity, we're going to use something called the kernel trick, which is going to allow us to completely bypass the weight vector altogether. We will never even need a weight vector. And we'll see that, we'll see how that comes about. 
using the idea of kernels. Okay, so that's kind of a high level preview of what we're going to do. So let's first start about talk about these feature transformations. So again, we're going to think about a transformation. We're going to call it phi. And this transformation is going to take our original raw features, maybe something like this in two dimensions. And it's going to transform it to a new space, higher dimensional space, where things are easier to classify linearly. So in this illustration, the colors are a bit hard to see, but there's some red points out here, and then there's some blue points in here. And there's no way in this original feature space that I could make a good classifier that's linear. OK, but maybe what I can do is I can construct this transformation, which, as you can see, is going to keep the raw features, but it's going to add one more feature, which is going to measure the squared distance from the center of the space. And so now I get this three-dimensional data distribution or feature distribution. And um, all the points on the outside are now up here in the third dimension. And all the points close to the origin are down here in the third dimension. And now I can very easily pass a plane through that and, and perfectly uh, linearly classify the red versus the blue. OK, so this is what we get. This is just a toy example just to illustrate the concept um, of, of what we're hoping to get with these uh, transformations. OK, so is that part pretty clear? All right. So yeah, so one theme is uh, map to a higher dimensional space. <clears throat> but as we can. We're going to see there's some issues. So this would be what we would do then. As you can see, in our previous formulation, wherever you saw xi, now we're just going to replace it with phi of xi. We're just doing this transformation to our data. Now we have a new data set, and we can just plug it directly in. And in fact, we can do the same thing. This is this is how we train, right? This is this is our training cost. We minimize this, we get our optimal parameters. Once we have those optimal parameters, we can construct Z using this expression, and then we take the sine of Z to get Y hat. So this is how we, we classify or we predict. And once again, you can see this, is, this used to be Xi in our previous formulation, and this used to be X, but now we've just applied our transformation both to our training data and our test data. And <clears throat> Sure, we could, we could try to do something like this. But the problem is, um, the problem occurs if the dimension phi of x is very high. Because then what that means <clears throat> is that this w vector here also, we need, you know, this needs to match the dimension. So this needs to be very high. So clearly, we're going to have computational issues. We may also have overfitting as well because there's many more parameters to adjust. <clears throat> and the problem becomes especially acute if we want to use a transformation that takes us into an infinite dimensional space. Now, you might say that that's really crazy. Why are we talking about infinite dimensions all of a sudden? Well, as it turns out, that the most popular methods uh, for what we're discussing now actually are infinite dimensional. So, you know, we simply cannot do this stuff if we have an infinite dimensional fee. There's no way to even compute fee explicitly. <clears throat> so this whole technique breaks down. Um, <clears throat> so again, we can't handle infinite dimensional W. We can't handle infinite dimensional fee. OK, and this is where something called the kernel trick comes into play. We can actually circumvent all these problems by being clever. So the first part of this, before we actually get to the kernel's trick, we need to rewrite the SVC in a way that's going to be more useful. And this, this, uh, this slide here might seem really confusing and not make any sense, because it really relies on a bunch of optimization theory that you probably don't know if you haven't already taken a course in convex optimization. 
So just bear with me. So essentially, <clears throat> this is a rewriting of our SVC problem into a different form that may look a little bit strange. This is called the Lagrangian dual form of the SVC. And when you look at what's going on, you see that there's no more B and W parameters. There's no more intercept and weights. Instead, there are these, you could say Lagrange or dual parameters. It's a, a vector of them, lambdas. <clears throat> and the, the cost has turned into this kind of strange expression here. And not only that, but there's some constraints on our lambdas. They have to be between zero and C individually. And when you multiply them by the YIs, they must sum to zero. So you'll just have to take it on faith that yes, this is, you know, this is another way of writing the, the training par part. And once we minimize this over lambda and we keep our lambda parameters, then it turns out that if you want to see what the Ws were, you could compute them this way. So you take your lambdas and your yi's and xi's and sum them up. And this will give you the w parameters that we're used to seeing, the weights. Similarly, this could give you the intercept term that we're used to seeing. Um, but the point is that actually, we don't really need to compute these w's. Once you compute these lambdas, you can use them directly to, to do your classification. And, um, and that's because, so let's see. So, so this over here, let me try not to cover that up. So if you think about this as W transpose and X, then clearly this becomes Z. I guess this is the optimal W transpose. This is our score. And we just take the sign of the score to get Y hat. And this is, this again is the same expression from above, where once again, we have the optimal W transpose. But again, the main point I wanna make is, <clears throat> You don't ever need to compute W. I'm just showing what the W form is just so that you can um, see the correspondence. But if what you do is you solve for these lambdas, they're all you need. Once you know the lambdas, you can compute um, Y hat this way. You can see there's no Ws involved. There is this B star, but you can compute the B star using the lambdas also, and there's no need to ever have the W, okay? And so <clears throat> this is just another way of doing the support vector classifier. It's called the dual form. Um, computationally, it, it's gonna, in, in a lot of problems, it's gonna be a bit faster. It kind of depends on the dimensionality of the data, the dimensionality of the features and so on. But in any case, this is, this is an option. Now, the reason why we're getting into this is that this is a very useful option when we have this transformation phi, uh, uh, phi of x. So again, here's the transformation. Now, remembering this dual form, um, if I wanna use this dual form SVC with my transform features, then wherever I see xi, x, j, x, I just need to plug in phi of the corresponding x. And when you do that, you get this. So here's the phi, the phi's, the phi's, the phi's. And as you can see, the x's never appear unless they're inside these phi's. And also, the phi's never appear alone. They always appear in this inner product form where we have one phi transpose another phi. So the point is that even if phi is infinite dimensional and you have a way of computing this inner product without ever looking at the individual phi, this guy is just a scalar. So the, 
the dimension of phi, assuming you can compute that whole thing, is not an issue. And in fact, this whole thing is called the kernel, the kernel function. <clears throat> so the kernel function is, you can just think about it as a function of two inputs, two different x's, x and x prime. Sometimes you want one to be the training, one to be the test. Other times you want one to be a training, the other to be another training vector. Um, but basically, there's a lot of problems where directly computing the kernel is much easier than computing the individual fees and then their inner product. And the point is, that's okay. That's what the kernel trick refers to. There's no need to compute the individual fee. You can just compute the kernel directly. And when you do that, as you can see, so in other words, this is going to be kappa xi x. This is going to be kappa xi xi star and kappa xi xj. Now, once we write it in terms of the kappa, you never get to see the dimension of the features or the transform features at all. So it doesn't matter if they're infinite dimensional. All you have is a scalar kappa, you have your yi's and so on, and that's it. You just have to solve this optimization problem over the lambdas. Once you know those lambdas, you can plug them in to get your uh, B star and then plug them in here to make your decisions. <clears throat> so, so this is what we call the kernel trick. Completely avoids the problem of the high dimensional fee. So what does the uh, X I star and Y I star refer to? So back here, yeah, sorry. I, I glossed over a few things in this slide, but it's a good time to come back to it. So when you compute B star, it turns out you can use uh, many different indices from your training data set. It doesn't matter which one, as long as it's some index such that you're using a positive lambda. So I star is any index that gives you a positive lambda. You, you're free to choose. That's what the I star means. <clears throat> okay, let's also try to make a little bit more sense of this. So as I said, this might look really unfamiliar, but let's think back to that gradient analysis that we did on page 20. And in particular, let's, wherever you see a lambda here, like here or here or here, think about that lambda as C times alpha I. And then when we go back to page 20, you're gonna see that we have exactly all of these expressions. All of these guys show up on page 20. So again, we're gonna be looking for like C alpha I, Y I, X I. Um, if this is true for C alpha I, then alpha I should be between zero and one. And we also want that C alpha I, Y I sum up to zero. So let's go back to page 20. So here we see, um, here we have that expression that was lambda i, y, i, x, i. Now we see it with c alpha i. Here we have the expression. I can put a c here because this equals zero. And then I have the c alpha i. That's also the same as lambda i, y, i. So we have that on the other page. We also notice that the alpha i's, um, OK, we have this question mark here. But it turns out that this question mark is going to be somewhere between 1 and 0, in which case the alpha i's are between 1 and 0. So c times alpha i, or lambda i, is between 0 and c. So a lot of what we did on that in that strange dual formulation actually is very familiar from what we're doing here. So that's part of the reason I'm presenting this, is just to try to make that dual formulation um, make a little bit more sense. 
or at least be a little bit more familiar. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, so we've talked about, again, um, let me just summarize what we said here. So we wanna come up with a fee function that somehow makes our data easier, or closer to linearly, linearly separable. But typically to do this, we have to increase our dimensionality. Increasing the dimensionality, I mean, if, if we had an explicit fee and it wasn't very high dimensional, like in this toy example here, three-dimensional, no problem. You could just transform all your data and you could run the support vector classifier like always, that would be fine. But in a lot of practical problems, you wanna use a very high dimensional fee, in which case all of a sudden there's a problem because W also needs to be equally high dimensional. So to get around this sort of two stages, first, instead of solving the SVC in this form, we rewrite it in an equivalent form called the dual form, which instead of solving for W and B, we solve for the lambdas. And once we have the lambdas, we can use them for prediction this way. With the dual form, the next step is, let's see what happens if we plug in phi of x instead of um, just x alone. And then we got to here, and we saw that interestingly, x or phi of x never appeared alone. It always appeared with a partner in this form. And we can give that form a name. It's called the kernel, kernel function. And now we can think about it, not in terms of the fee anymore, but just in terms of the kernel itself. So forget the fees and just say, I'm gonna build a good kernel. And the good kernel should sort of implicitly define some transformation to a higher dimensional space where everything is easier to classify. But I guess if we have a kernel, we don't really even need to talk about the explicit transformation. If we have a good kernel and that works well, that's enough. So that's the kernel trick and that's where we're headed. The next thing to talk about is how do I build these kernels? Before we do that, are there any questions on anything so far? Okay, so here are the most, so the most popular kernel by far is this radial basis function kernel. It actually has a very intuitive form. <clears throat> Keep in mind, the kernel, all these kernels, what they do is they measure a similarity between their two inputs, x and x prime. So let's look at the radial basis function kernel. All it's doing is looking at the Euclidean distance squared between x and x prime. So that's clearly a notion of similarity. And then it's exponentiating it. So what that means is that if these, if x and x prime are close, that means the Euclidean distance is small. And because I have a negative lambda in the exponent, then this is gonna be a number a little bit less than one if they're close, right? Because in fact, as they become the same thing, then the norm is zero and e to the zero is one. So as they get a little bit farther apart, it's a little bit less than one. However, as they get very far apart, this norm gets large. And then I take a negative scaling of it and I exponentiate that, and that's gonna be a tiny number. So what happens is this is sort of a non-linearity that you apply on this distance function that says when samples are close, think of them as, as similar. And when, as they get farther apart, think of them as completely unrelated. So it just focuses on the local samples near each other and, and ignores them once they're past a certain distance away. So that's essentially what's happening. And these other ones are actually kind of variations on that. So here's another one. This is the polynomial uh, kernel. <clears throat> so in this polynomial one, you take this inner product between your two x's, you scale it, you can shift it if you want, and then you take it to some power d. So again, you know, typically d is going to be a number greater than one. So like two is a popular option. And it doesn't have 
quite the strong effect as exponent exponentiation, but it has sort of a similar effect where it pays attention to samples that are close together. And once they get further apart, it pays less attention to them. Then we have a sigmoidal kernel is another option um, where we put this thing inside a hyperbolic tangent. Or if you want to connect this with what we did previously, if you just use this linear kernel, then we're back to this SVC that we talked about in the previous lecture. So um, that's just the trivial transformation where we're actually not doing any transformation at all. <clears throat> so again, these are all different ways of measuring the similarity. And notice that of these kernels all have these tunable parameters like gamma. This is called the, uh, the kernel width. So gamma is going to control you know, how quick this exponentiation kicks in. And it's going to basically control like how close does a do two samples have to be to count them as uh, not almost infinitely far away. So that's that's controlled by gamma. Some of these kernels have two parameters, um, like this. You know, these guys also have an R. Although of course you could set R to zero. And in general, all these parameters we need to tune using cross validation. Um, so we want to jointly tune our gammas as well as our, our C, our regularization strength, together. <clears throat> now, an interesting point about this radial basis function kernel is that if you try to kind of reverse engineer the phi that corresponds, the transformation that would give you this, you can convince yourself that this would need to be an infinite dimensional transformation. And one of the ways you can do that is you can write this RBF kernel in terms of um, here are some scaling factors, and then this is an infinite sum. This is the uh, the power series of of the exponential, and then here you have all these different inner products raised to different powers j, where j starts at zero and goes all the way up to infinity. So <clears throat> this is trying to give some intuition as to why this radial basis function kernel cannot be described using any phi with a finite number of parameters. It ends up that you need an infinite number to essentially capture this, this infinite sum. So in other words, we cannot implement the radial basis kernel function via any phi function explicitly because it's infinite dimensional. But the whole point with the kernel trick is we don't need to. As long as we have this kernel defined, that's all we need. And as you can see, this kernel is very inexpensive to compute. It's basically just you compute this norm and you know and exponentiate that scalar. So, so again, the kernel trick is uh, is is needed here to uh, to use this uh, radial basis function kernel. All right, so any, any questions on, on the kernel functions or the kernel trick before we move on to how we implement this? Okay. So in, in sklearn, uh, not surprisingly, this is very easy to do. In this case, we're gonna use the command SVC. And when we use SVC, we can choose the kernel. So we can, the default is the radial basis function. But you can also choose the polynomial, the sigmoid, the linear, or you can program your own custom kernel and have it use that. <clears throat> you have to specify the kernel width, and you also have to specify um, that C parameter, which we know controls the number of support vectors. And we want to optimize all those parameters using cross validation. <clears throat> so there's a nice example in the sklearn documentation if you'd like to see that. What we're gonna do, and this is in the demo, what we're gonna do is we're just going to rely on uh, someone else that has a nice little tutorial here where he optimized the parameters C and gamma jointly. And he came up with these values for MNIST as values that work pretty well. So we're just gonna use his tuning, plug those parameters in. And here you can see we're gonna 
we're going to invoke our SVC. We're going to tell it radial basis function kernel. We're going to tell it those parameters. And then, like always, we call the fit method on the training data. We call the predict method on the test features, get our predicted test labels, computer accuracy, and so on. And what's cool now is that the accuracy has jumped from 90 one percent approximately up to 97 percent so this is a huge improvement over uh, the previous linear methods and this is what we can get with this nonlinear transformation which is implicitly implemented through the kernels so um, and also remember that we have only been using um, 10,000 of our training samples instead of 70,000 so Presumably, if we would use the full training data set and if we did some more parameter tweaking, we could go above 97% and we can get you know, close to some of the values in the table that I showed you at the beginning of this unit. All right, so this is a question. Is it correct to think of the kernels as measuring the overlap of the vectors? I would say, um, I don't know about overlap because the vectors are just points in an N or yeah, a D-dimensional space. So the kernel is really measuring how close they are. But, or you, know, you could say, at least, okay, this one is measuring closeness in a Euclidean sense. This one is not measuring closeness in a Euclidean sense, but it's measuring how, something about how, how uh, aligned they are. Are they in the same direction if I move away from the origin? Um, so it's, it's using a different measure. And that's why I've been referring to it as a similarity. It's measuring how similar they are. And depending on the kernel you use, it's just a different definition of what we mean by similar. And, um, but also it's not just Euclidean distance. There's sort of this warping of it. And the warping is, it's, it's saying like, okay, points that are, for the RBF kernel, points that are close by in Euclidean sense are, are treated as similar. And as I move the, those points farther away, because of this exponentiation, I think of them as now very different, very dissimilar. So this, this, this nonlinearity is helping us focus on the local neighborhood rather than like global stuff. And, and this is gonna help a lot. So I don't know if that answers the question. <clears throat> All right, so so just a, a few more things about, yeah, just one more slide actually, about the implementation. <clears throat> um, let's say that you wanted to do an SVM with more than two classes. Okay. So what are our options here? So it turns out that we're a bit constrained in terms of what sklearn allows us to do. So let me show you a few of the options. So if you wanna do an SVM with greater than two classes, one option at our disposal is to separately train one versus rest classifier. So we talked about this in the context of logistic regression, SVC. The question is, okay, can you do this with an SVM in scikit-learn? It turns out that the answer is not really. You can do it using linear SVC, but as we know, when I do linear SVC, that's like doing SVC with a linear kernel. So if I want to do this with a radial basis function kernel, the answer is no. Scikit-learn does not give me a way of doing one versus rest training um, directly with K greater than two classes. Now, I guess you could manually split up your data in different ways, and you could manually run uh, your SVM with RBF kernel if you want, but it would require a little bit more work than uh, what, you know, sklearn makes easy. <clears throat> okay, we also talked about another option of joint training, which is that Cromer Singer approach. But again, in sklearn, the only way to do that is linear SVC, which again is only for the linear kernel. So we can't do this with, for example, radial basis function kernel. Okay, but there is one more option that uh, sklearn gives us. And this is the one versus one classifier. So we talked about this 
way at the beginning of unit five. So let's just review a little bit. In a one versus one approach to training, what you do is you split your data set up into class pairs. So you take pairs of class little k and some other class little k prime. Obviously, they have to be different. <clears throat> and if you think about it, if you have a total of capital K classes, then the unique class pairs that we're talking about are, it's like the lower triangle. So like in this little picture here, I'm saying we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So if I'm looking for unique pairs, I have like two versus one, three versus one, four versus one, then I have three versus, uh, let's see, did I, I may have, uh, what am I doing wrong? No, actually, no, sorry, everything's fine. So I have, yeah, one versus two, three, and four, two versus three and four, and three versus four. So those are all the unique ways that I can come up with, um, you know, two, two different classes where each class is somewhere between one and four. And in, in total, this is gonna be K times K minus one over two. So what you do is for each of these, like you, you do class two versus class one and you train your SVM this way. And then you do class three versus class one, you train your SVM this way and so on. <clears throat> And, um, and this is implemented in SVM, SVC. So this is, this is the option that we have if we wanna do SVM with more than two, um, two classes total. And again, in this case, we can use a variety of kernels, um, SVM, so the radial basis function, poly, et cetera. <clears throat> but notice that when you do this, it is slower than linear SVC, but it's a, it's a different method, right? Because we can do things that we can't do with linear SVC. And the last thing I wanna say is there is another version. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a reparameterization. It's called new SVC and it solves the same problem as, as, uh, as SVC, but rather than providing it the, C, the, the number C, so instead of using C, you give it a parameter new, which is somewhere between zero and one. And new is a lower bound on the fraction of support vectors of your total training set. <clears throat> so like if you gave it new equals 0.5, that would mean that it's gonna find it's, it's going to construct a classifier that uses at least half of your training as support vectors. It may use more, but it's going to use at least 50%. So this is just another way of specifying the information that we usually control with C. So some people find it more intuitive to specify the new number rather than the C number because it's interpretable. Whereas when we specify C, it indirectly controls the number of support vectors, but it's hard to say what will a value of C equals one give you? You know, I don't know, you just gotta try it. So, so new SVC is just an equivalent formulation with a slightly different interface. And um, so that's, that's it for, for this unit. Are there any last questions on anything? All right, so you get a chance to play with these things in the, in the lab. Um, and then <clears throat> I'm almost done grading the midterms, so I will, uh, probably finish those today. I'm hoping to finish them today. And then I can discuss the midterm solutions uh, next week, probably on Monday. All right. So if there's no more questions, I uh, hope everybody has a good weekend. See you next week. <clears throat>